Well, my friends, thanks for being here. We are honored today to host somebody who I, I look up to, and uh, Ping Fu. Ping Fu is an admired 3D uh, pioneer and a remarkably successful entrepreneur. As co-founder and CEO of Geomagic, she was named Inc. Magazine's uh, Entrepreneur of the Year in 2005. Before, founding, uh, before co-founding Geomagic, she managed the team that created NCSA Mosaic, which later became the Netscape browser, which of course gave us the internet boom. So Ping was there right at the beginning of the internet boom. And with a name like Ping, you sort of expect to be involved in the internet. <laughs> Sorry, engineer joke for those on YouTube. <laughs> Ping was also named an outstanding American by choice and she advises the White House on innovation and entrepreneurship. But more than her success and her talents, what I most admire about Ping is how she deals with adversity after adversity in her life with amazing resilience, and more importantly, kindness and compassion. Her, her new book, her latest book, is her, her autobiography, Ben Not Break, available in Google Play and all other major bookstores. Uh, in the next hour, Ping and I will talk about the exciting world of 3D technology and uh, Ping's fascinating life story. And with that, let's welcome Ping Fu. Thank, Thank you for you, being man. here. Yeah. Yeah. So happy Pleasure to have to you. Mm -hmm. So let me begin with a question, Ping. You, you live a fascinating life. Uh, but if you were to boil down your life story to a few sentences, how would you describe it? Well, my life is really truly an American sto uh, story, mm -hmm. American dream story. Um, I would say I lived three lives. Um, For the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> For price of one, yes. <laughs> Maybe I'm writing the next chapter of the life. Um, I lived in China. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and then being exiled, mm -hmm. and I arrived in the United States as fresh off boat, poor immigrants tried to um, look for a new life, and I did gone through all the new immigration story, and and then later start a business and become an entrepreneur. So that's why I said there's a three chapters of my life, but really that it uh, shows the. Human, human spirit of adaptability to change and the power of resilience. Mm -hmm. You're very modest. You describe your life as fairly normal, but you, your life is extraordinary. And, and I give you a, a sense of how extraordinary it is. Um, so when I read your book, the, the first few chapters made me want to cry. It was that bad. I mean, it was, it was, your, your early life to me was horrendous. Right? Um, you would taken away from your parents at the age of eight, and you had to fend for yourself and your baby, your baby sister home at the time, at eight years old. And then you were gang raped at 10. You were hungry, you were beaten, were abused, endless, endlessly abused for years. And then as an adult, you were thrown into prison for documenting the effects of, or documenting uh, female infanticide, and they were exiled from your own country. And then, as if that's not bad enough, <laughs> you arrive in the United States, and your first experience in the US was getting kidnapped. <laughs> and what I want to know is, is this. Like, so first, I'm, I'd like to invite you to tell us, the, the audience, about your early experience in your own words. And more importantly, I want to know how you managed to preserve your goodness your kindness, your compassion, despite such a horrible experience? Thank you, man. That's a very mindful question. Um, so let me first bring you back to 1966. That was at the dawn of China's infamous Cultural Revolution. Mao decided to turn the country upside down so all schools were closed. I was eight years old. I was raised by my aunt and uncle, which, who I thought was my biological parents. And I had 
five older siblings, and I was the youngest one in the family. So one day, I heard noise down in our courtyard. I already knew the country's kind of turned upside down, so I saw they came for my mother, who, who was my aunt, but they came for me. And that was the day that the red guard came into our house and told me that my mother was not my mother. And I was screaming and crying and said, no, 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 you're lying. I tell my mother, you're lying. I, I, I am your child. Just a week ago, you told me I was your favorite. And I wasn't even given the chance to give her a hug when I was ripped away from the, family, the only family that I knew and put on a train from Shanghai South Station to send to Nanjing, which, were, which is where my biological parents lived. And I arrived just a little bit too late. When I arrived in Nanjing, all I saw was big dusk, dusts on the street, thousands of people, chaos. You can smell blood. And my biological parents were put on a truck, being taken away, sent far, far away in exile. And my mother, on the back of the truck, screamed out my name, Ping, please take care of your sister. And a little bit later of that day, I was um, putting into a dormitory, led to a second floor of her own. There I found my little sister, four years old. And the room was dusty, full of gar garbage, not even having a bed. The only shining place was this concrete floor where she kicked her legs and polished that place. And she was crying probably for hours. Her eyes were red shot. Uh, I saw she was going to go blind. That was my first day. I lost the parents who raised me. I lost the parents who bound me. And I became surrogate mother to my little sister. Um, then, little did I know, cultural revolution would last for 10 years. And I was in that ghetto, and one room with no bed, no bedroom, no wash basin for the next 10 years. I've gone through a lot of atrocity that you will see um, in the book. And then when I was 10 years old, my sister was thrown into a canal, water canal outside the wall, and I jumped in to try to save her. I did save her, but I didn't spare myself. I was gang raped by a group of teenagers, um, broken, cut up with knife. I still have 40 stitches on my body, almost died. And, um, but the physical injury was not the most hurtful thing. What was most hurtful was the emotional abuse that followed. At 10, I really didn't understand anything. I, um, I just thought it was beaten badly and, um, but the rumor went around, and, and I had a nickname, Broken Shoes, which means that you were so worn out that nobody would want you. So at 10, I was a ruined woman. And I had no adults um, to turn to. I have no psychologist to talk to. I have no one to help me. And many times I thought about dying. I thought about this life is not worth living. But I had this little sister that I have to take care of. I couldn't just die. I need to. I have responsibilities. I think if I didn't have her, I probably would have treated my life much lighter. So let me force forward to end of Cultural Revolution. And then um, that was literally 12 years later. Uh, China reopened university in 1977. And I studied to try to pass national exam to go into college. I did, I did pass, I did go into college. I was known as the girl whose lights never turned off. My life turned around, China started to change. When I was in college, I studied Chinese literature. I actually wanted to be astronaut, but I didn't have a choice. So I went to study Chinese literature. Um, Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de definitely. So I, um, during, uh, when I, Kind of the last semester before I graduate, I thought I was going to go graduate school, so I went to do a thesis. And China was imposing one child policy, and I heard that there was widespread killing of baby girls in the countryside. So I decided to choose that as a topic. And 
And that research being aired in some of Chinese newspaper where Chinese government was calling for stop killing. But that was the first documentation from China that admitted widespread killing was uh, happening. And that news um, being picked up by international newspaper and UN post -san sanction for human rights violation. So this was an embarrassment for the new government at the time Deng Xiaoping has already taken over China. Cultural revolution was over, so this was a embarrassment to the new government and I got in trouble and got thrown in jail and um, and then but that was only three days. Uh, I was lucky that Deng Xiaoping had asked what happened to the reporter and they said well we throw him in, uh, we throw her in jail and he said why this is not cultural revolution anymore um, but he didn't give me any other instructions so nobody knew what to do with me and I was let out and then two weeks later, I was given a passport and told to leave the country and never to come back again. And not to file a political asylum because my parents and my sister were in China. And I applied many universities in many countries and I ended up in the United States. So your question is, how did I live a life like that and um, remain to be to see good and to be yes, kind. Yes, preservation of goodness. Yeah, the preservation with goodness. So when I was little, um, my, my uncle, who I thought was my father, had taught me many of those human principles. She, he, he told me that you, uh, you don't do things to other people, that you, know, you don't want to treat other people, not the way you treat, how you want to be treated. Uh, he also told me that if you are straight, you're not worried about your shadow, it's not. And another thing that he had me memorize is what's called Three Friends of Winter. And bamboo is one of it, which is what I wrote in my book. And he told me that Ping, you need to be bamboo, bending with prevailing wind, but never breaking. And when I was going through Cultural Revolution, I know that if I don't focus on goodness, then I couldn't live my day. So even in the darkest time, there are human kindness from different places. I would find food left out of my door. Even though people don't dare to be associated with us, people were secretly trying to help us. Um, there would be beauty always in the ugliness if you wanted to seek for it. I also found being good helps me to survive because when you're good to others, make, it makes it very hard for others to be crew to you. So I just continued to focus on that. Thank you. So you came to America uh, after surviving kidnapping. Uh, I remember <laughs> reading that you, you came only knowing three words of English, which is hello, uh, help, and thank you. Very useful, yeah. three <laughs> words. Right. That's right. You should have also added, uh, how, where, where's the toilet? Right? <laughs> okay. So I will add it. <laughs> and and you, you came basically crippled in, in language. And, and then uh, when you went to graduate school, you switched over to computer science. And what you, what you say was because you, you, would, you realized mistakenly at the time, or you were told that computer science is a different language. Yes. And then you would think, since I'm crippled in English, if I learn a new language, then you know, I'll be on a fair level playing field. Right? For those of you wondering why all the Chinese immigrants are software engineers, <laughs> <laughs> that's the reason. <laughs> that, yeah, that's, that's a secret. And, and what is even more fascinating was that you went to class, you, you, took, you were in a master's class in computer science, and you went to class not knowing the basic mathematical concepts, like fractions. And you wrote that you, you saw writing a, a professor writing a white, on a red, the blackboard numbers and then line between, you're like, what's that? Right. So how was it like back then to be in that situation? Well, that, yeah, that's a very good question. So I. Um, like a man said, I came here, I thought I was going to study comparative literature, my English was too poor, and I, and I can't study science because I didn't go through K-12 education, so I asked around. And somebody said, oh yeah, there's a new field called computer science, and um, I said, what's that? They said, well, it's man-made language, and you, use, you, you learn that to make stuff. I said, oh great. Um, I'm good with language, and I know how to make stuff, and that's how I got into computer science. And because I didn't go to formal ed education, I didn't 
you know, um, study mathematics in classroom. When I went to study computer science, the first class I took was calculus. Um, I was okay with the new concept when, when, it, when the professor was teaching. If it's new, I can follow. And when, she, when he put fraction on the blackboard, I've just never seen anything like that. And when I asked the professor, he said, go back to high school. And I took it very literally. I went to get the high school math. I couldn't find it. I went back to get middle school class. I couldn't find it. I found it on second grade uh, math book. So I bought, in, I actually borrowed entire um, math book from uh, first grade to high school and study at night and study um, calculus during the day. And the smart student in the class said, Ping, you really don't need that much. You just go get a calculator. As long as you understand the concept, rest of the things, you can use calculator. That was very helpful. I mean, back then, we actually don't really have a computer yet. Today, you can do anything. Um, but that also tells you, like, um, you can learn a lot of things even if you didn't have it. And that's what I did. I didn't study everything in the, in, in the book. I just went to look for whatever I needed, and, and, and plus calculator, plus asking people, and got by. First, first semester, I almost failed, failed my um, math class. But by the second semester, the professor saw a second math class, not the first, second semester. The second calcula calculus was, uh, I think it was multivariable calculus. The professor saw that I was a sister of the Olympic math champion. I thought I arrived, yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. Thank you. So, 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 so one point about your question is, from, lo from time to time, I would feel like I'm the most stupid person in the room, even though a lot of people think I'm wickedly smart. Um, because like, often, I would have people talking in the room, and I was sitting there and knowing I was the only thing, have absolutely no clue what they are talking about. There's just no context in back of my head. And in some way, it's good because I, um, I have to learn, so I have this infinite curiosity. And it also keeps me humble, no matter how, you know, how smart I could be. But I, I constantly feel I have this stupidity in me. <laughs> Speaking about humble, so, so let's fast forward to today. And today, you are one of the most admired people around, maybe in the world. Right? Uh, you are very successful. You are a successful entrepreneur and engineer. Uh, you were named uh, the Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, and you give advice to President Obama. I also give advice, but the, but the difference is that he invited you. He didn't invite me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just came here on email. He comes to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so you are, you've done, I mean, you're amazingly successful, right? up, up to and including being a presidential advisor. So how do you feel about your success today, especially in the context of your overall life? That's a good question. I think originally um, I did get my head blown up a little big, like balloons. But what I realized, success is kind of like balloon, they disappear very quickly. Uh, it's kind of like raise and getting a salary. You know, first day you get excited, the next day you forget about it. Uh, so I don't really think about success um, because I don't even know how to define it. I think about contribution. Um, I think it's easy to think about contribution, and the contribution can be for yourself, for your loved ones, for your community, for the people who you know, or for people who you don't know. And you don't have to do, you don't have to contribute everything every day, but if you can contribute something, mm -hmm. some days, that makes everybody feel good. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. I, I, like, I like how you define your, your success as a contribution rather than as rather a than the source success, of glory. Yeah. 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 So uh, I have to ask you about your shoes. These, these, these shoes are very cool. So <laughs> let's tell you a bit more about your shoes. So yeah, um, so this is a 3D printed shoe. And um, it actually is a MoMA piece. And it's displayed in uh, Modern Museum of Art in New York. And it's a mesh up of many things. So on the, on the top of my shoe has, you know, Google logo, L plans, chance guns, 
um, anything. You, you can just put it on. Um, the bottom of the shoe is actually a play on material. So instead of being solid, you put a lot of geometry structure in there to make it both strong, lightweight, and flexible. Right? And then the material is linen. So linen is biodegradable, unlike plastic. And it's incredibly strong because it's natural fiber. And then the shape of the shoe, let me take it off, is um, the arch of my feet. And, and it's also, uh, we have done um, fluid dynamic to make sure that it is fitting not only to the shape of my feet, but also how I walk, my body weight, and whether or not my feet tilt from in or out. Um, so this is the same principle being made for Lady Gaga's shoe. If you're wondering how he could be able to dance on the stage with 12 inches here without falling, it's because it's perfectly balanced to his body and his, uh, to her body and her movement. Um, I started Geomagic to uh, try to create software that produce one of the kind product that start with us, the person, not um, building a product, start with a product. And if you don't know about 3D printing, uh, 3D printing is very similar to 2D printing. Uh, it's used the same inject nozzles instead of coming out with with ink, uh, it comes out with material. And it prints one layer at a time. If you just take one layer, it's just like 2D printing other than it's, it's depositing material. And then it uses various curing method to harden the material. Then you do it one layer at a time. Therefore, you can build very intricate uh, internal structures because you build it one layer at a time. Um, I think in in very short distance, the future, you will all have a 3D printer at home, and you would, and you would all have a 3D scanner at home or 3D camera at home, and that would be really, really cool. Because if you think about publishing industry, the desktop publishing completely changed how publishing is being done, and desktop manufacturing or desktop fabrication will completely change how things are made. Um, this can go from airplane parts to Invisalign to shoes, uh, e even to the bow printing. Like uh, we already today can print bone scaffold, um, organs, leather without killing animals, um, meat. Maybe we can produce wood proteins without having to have slaughterhouses and, and raising costs that taking out a lot of energy. Wow. That is cool. <laughs> Stop, you can Here's eat. the buck joys. Um, th those are all created by kids from school. They take your standard uh, Android figure array and then they put design on it and then push a button and it gets printed. So when, when you went out to, to do this, uh, you wanted to do personal factories, uh, PF, yes. which is your <laughs> initials. Yes. So, so did you feel that you achieved uh, personal factories yet, or is that in the future? I think now it's at a taking off point. Mm -hmm. um, when I started Geomagic, that's about 15 years ago, I saw a demonstration from 3D Systems founder, Chuck Hall. He was showing a machine called Stereolithography Machine and today we call them 3D printer or additive manufacturing or personal factory. I, I, it, it blew my mind. So I said, this is, I, I want to do this. And, and that was at the internet high. Everybody was, you know, uh, Jack Welsh was talking about destroyyourself.com. And I worked with Mark Andres and started Mosaic Become Netscape. Everybody was surprised. Why would you start a manufacturing company? It's not sexy. Yeah, it takes 15 years, and now it's the hottest industry. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Cool. Um, there are two things I really appreciate uh, having you talk about in the context of being a business leader, and it's not success. It's not even contribution. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate you talking about is, is this quote, it is all about love. And the other is, is, is very similar to the first thing, which is you always try to make the compassionate choice. Right? If you have two choices, you always make the choice that's more compassionate. And, and in your words, you say, choose, always choosing to love 
and to understand. So can you talk more about love and compassion in the context of business leadership? Yeah, okay. Um, so when, in, in terms of a business, um, one of the things I said about the business in the 2000s, which is after internet crash came, and everybody said this is an incredibly difficult time to run business, is what I observed a renaissance movement of social consciousness for business. And I do think like down market contributed to that. And Google is a, is a great company that embodies social, social consciousness and business can live together. So I remember um, a lot of time I get MBA students coming to interview and they would ask me, what's your exit strategy? I would say the exit sign is clearly marked. Um, <laughs> and, and the people would ask me, what is your goal for next five years, you know, where you want the geomagic to be. I said, you know, I only want one thing, which is people come in to work here, they love what they do, and they love what they work with. And that's why I say it's all about love. And if you don't love what you do, you're wasting your life, right? If you don't love who you're working with, you're not enjoying what you're doing. And, and love and business are so intimately related. I couldn't, I cannot see any great companies doesn't love their people and their people doesn't love their company. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's that. And then to come back to talk about compassion and understanding, and this is a part of, um, I've been searching um, business and, and startup business and big business are quite different. People talk about business models, they talk about how to run business, uh, management principles and all of those being written a lot. But I wake up in the morning, I tell myself every day, I want to practice compassion and understanding. I go around, talk to employees, or I go outside to, to, to try to understand in the society, what problem can we solve and what value can we create? And that's the understanding part. It's, uh, if, as a CEO, my job is to bring bringing outside world into the company. And no business and service should exist if they're not there to solve problems. Okay. So my job is to bring us our world into the company. But I also need to fundamentally understand what we can actually do to, to, to help the world, or what kind of talent our people have, or what, what, what they can create. So, and then also how we can understand each other, how they understand the problem. And every, every day I tell myself that's the two things I need to practice. If I can practice that, I can help to create a great, great business. Mm -hmm. um, whatever the management or business principle people wants to bring in or, or people think that's good, that's fine. You, you said at Google, if it's fun, we do it. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I say uh, if, uh, because it's fun or because it's cool, if it's good enough reason to do anything. It's good enough reason to do anything, <laughs> yeah, yes. Google, yes. Yeah. So, so which, uh, uh, if, if you're running a, a bigger company, let's say something the size of Google, 30,000 employees, will you still be employing the same, the same uh, philosophy? And if so, how do you imagine doing that? Yeah, I, the very good question. Um, with startup company, because startup company is in the place to search a repeatable and scalable business. They're not in known market. They're not having known customers. Larger company have known employee, a uh, known market and known customers. And also with a small startup company, you know everyone. You don't need a lot of process. Mm -hmm. So you could actually trust your people and hope that there's going to be good business to come. When you be, become Google size, you can't, you can't just trust and hope. You really need to do trust and track, right? So that's where the big data, the, the measurement mm -hmm. comes in. I would still practice the same compassion and understanding, but I, maybe I need to understand different things. Maybe I need the tools to help me with data to understand things rather than just talking to people. That's not enough. But I would still do the same, same philosophy, mm -hmm. and it just needs different tools to help me to achieve the same understanding mm -hmm. and compassion. Very cool. So uh, right now, Ping, what do you want to be when you grow up? 
great. It's all about love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, I am design next stage of my life. I think um, it's, it would be great at every stage. You can say, what, what do you want to be um, when you grow up? Not very long ago, I met this fortune tailor from, um, from India. And he was telling me that he had read many, many people's he, he reads hand, including Dalai Lama and uh, Deng Xiaoping and so on and so forth. I don't know that's true or not, but I just assume it's true. And so he read my hand and he said to me, and this was actually five years ago, he says, you, you're, when you grow up, <laughs> you will be a teacher. And so this may be what I will do. And I, I, I don't actually think I will be a teacher. I think I probably will be a midwife to give birth for you know, good ideas or good things that come from other people. And that's probably what I'll do. I'll be, bit, be midwife. Cool. Yeah. And, and teacher at the same time. So um, I want to leave about half an hour for, for you to ask uh, ask Ping some questions. Uh, but uh, do we have a mic for yeah. them? OK, so, so while Stephanie is passing out a mic, I want to ask you one more question, which is, um, Ping, how are you going to save the world? And how do I and how do we, Google, help you save the world? Wow, that's a big question. Yeah. yeah. So when I started Geomagic, I wanted to save the world by combining handcraftsmanship with IT technology. Okay. And, and I wanted to bring back much of what we humans have created in thousands of years, the treasures, the memory, the collective um, treasure to bring it to the future generation. I feel that's, that's our responsibility. And I still feel that this is the space I want to be in and this is what I will do to save the world. Um, in, from a Google point of view, um, I, I always admire Google search, but I do have a request. Um, I know you do incredible job in organizing word information and, and you know, delivering needed information to me um, in my fingertip, but they're still remaining in the text and image and 2D world. And, and I want to you to help to create search information which will, which will search shapes in 3D. And it will, it will matching, you know, it will, say, say if, if, if I want to save the world to create, to deliver customized product to you, customized medicine to, to you, uh, as a human, but how do we search all these things that are not just text and image and, and, and files that display on flat screen or can be printed on flat piece of paper and use that to create whether or not it's, whether or not I broke my bone, I want a customized cast that to be made that, that I can put it on. Or if I want to buy a pair of shoes that shoot doesn't have to be made. I can just upload my shape of my feet and say, this is the shape. This is, this is what I want and make one for me, right? So the search is a part of the product design itself. The search actually is embedded in what I want. It's not advertisement. It's, it, it, the value is, is embedded before the product is even developed. Why that's important? Today, we produce 80% of goods that's never needed. You know, you have to produce, if you produce 100%, you sell 20%. The other 80% are, are more or less wasted, either, either reduce the price or whatever. So that, that's one thing. And then we also ship them across the sea, which is not green. We also use a lot of inventories. And, and we waste a lot of time. And we're very frustrated, right? Um, so I think if you can, if the search can be embedded in the design itself, and imagine in the future, everything you buy, or everything you use doesn't even have to be your buy. Everything you use in terms of product is a software code. And then, and then your search is embedded in that software code. So for those of you who want to help Ping save the world, please feel free to talk to her. Uh, one more comment I want to make before we pass the mic. Is, uh, uh, what you said earlier reminded me of something. There was a four-star general in the U.S. Army whose name escapes me right now, but his advice for people who ask him for advice about life, his, his advice is, don't stop falling in love. 
for a four-star general to say that, that, that blew my mind. And mm. so what you just said reminded me of that. And with that, uh, anybody want to ask a question? The mic is over there. Um, thank you for coming here. Your story is very inspirational. Um, so I do want to uh, talk about um, the times when it was not so easy uh, to look at the world so positively, and it was not so easy to, uh, to think about compassion or love. So how did you pick yourself up? And um, it's easier to say that there is a bright side and there is love in the darkest moments and there is always something, right? So, so how did you pick, pick yourself up and um, when you see your guesters who are uh, you know, struggling with those kind of things, what do you say to them? So that's a very good question. Um, when, when the world is cruel to you, when the things are dark, when you're really in a rat hole, how do you pick yourself up? How do you... Uh, I think there are two things at play. One part, I like to say that I may be born with a good genes. <laughs> you know, we, we do all have our DNAs and so some, everybody gets um, born with different kind of personality. Um, the other part is I did find that sometimes when you go through very deep atrocity and you come out on the other side, it, it gives you that optimism. Because, because it's like for me, every time the door is closed, something else happens. So I believe that behind every closed door, there's open space because my life tells me, teaches me that, right? Um, when I don't have enough English, I study computer science. Look where I am today. Um, when I got kicked out of China, I did not know what kind of life I would have in, Amer in America. Look where I am today, right? Uh, but in those dark moments, part of it is also I, I did that for survival. Because if I'm not going to be kind, I'll get beaten. So I, I have no choice. But when I was kind, I find other people returning the kindness. And the other thing is, I did not have any right back then. I was forced in stage to, to scream, I was nobody, and I'm worse than the buck beneath your feet. So after, I, I was eight, so after I said that many times, I started to believe that. I started to believe I did not have right. When you believe you don't have a right, you're pretty vulnerable. And when I was vulnerable, I find other people help me. Okay, so sometimes it isn't that you're strong, you're successful, you're great, that you see goodness. A lot of time it is when you're in the dirt, when you really need help, that little bit kindness that people show you become this big. And that's what I grab on. That's what I, you know, just latch to it. And, and then I also truly understand how important that is to me. And that's why I practice compassion, because I've been there. I've been in those places where that little bit of compassion saved my life. I don't even know the person who showed me that knows that. I, when I landed in America, I had an $80 traveler's check in San Francisco. The man, the American man behind me, gave $5 to the ticket counter so that I could buy my ticket to, to go to university. I have no money. I don't know for him $5 means a lot to him. But for me, that was a life to me. So I learned through my life, why in doubt, always err on the side of generosity. Um, so how, how do you feel the, all the uh, trauma that you had as a child, how did that affect you kind of adversely when you, as you grew up, let's say, in relationships and everything? Because you obviously had very uh, unusual relationships as a child, you know, miss, you know losing you know, all your, most of your relatives and then coming here not knowing anybody. And, Obviously, that had some, maybe had some adverse effects. And I know there's a lot of debate about, oh, kids with tough childhoods, you know, how that affects them later in life, you know, positively and negatively. Some people say, actually, there's very little correlation between how, what happened to them as a child and what happens to them as an adult, how they come in their relationships and other, other schools of thought say it has a very profound effect. So how did it affect you personally? Yeah. Um 
So I, I think Nietzsche said, what doesn't break you makes you stronger. And I do believe practice makes you stronger, like sports or um, programming. I just have a lot more practice over a certain <laughs> skill set. Um, but then I like what you said, that it could also affect you a different way. I do not wish anyone to live the life I have. I do not believe that by living through the type of life that I lived made me successful. I don't think there's a causality. Um, but I do believe that because I lived through this kind of life, I over-practiced certain things. For example, by not going to school, I over-practiced self-learning. And self-learning is a very important aspect of entrepreneurship because there's no book to teach you how to be a CEO. Uh, I, I practiced how to deal with uh, adversity, which helped me to help the company to survive, for example. But there, there's also um, the normal human relationship. The, the, I didn't have it, so I could be overly Maybe I could be overly critical or less sensitive to other people. Um, I don't think whatever is a big deal, and that's not right. This is why I'm practicing compassion every day or practicing understanding every day because I feel that's important because I have a different context as how other people uh, grew up. And this became more important when I became a mother because my daughter grew up in completely, you know, protected environment and never know a day of atrocity. So how do I bring up a daughter who's just had everything and, 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 and make sure that she will become independent? What I realized is it is not what it is not the what happened to you that's important. It is how you deal with the emotional intensity when things that happen to you. So for example Something could be very simple would give my daughter this much in emotional intensity would give me nothing, right? And it would take a lot to give me this big emotional intensity. But the emotional intelligence or fluency is the same skill. It's independent of the event, but it is dependent on how you react to it and how you think about it. So that's, that's, that's my realization. It's, we all have our own response to life event to us. And we can't control what life is going to throw at us. Life is messy. Life is going to throw anything at anybody. Everybody's life is a story. So it's how we deal with it that's important. And that's what I try to express in this book also. So how do you do it? How do you teach young people, uh, teenagers, about dealing with emotions? Yeah, so it's not about not to have emotion, mm -hmm. which I actually have very little. <laughs> I, I kind of try to learn to have emotion, whereas people around me, I kind of feel like, whoa, I saw this drama. Um, but I, over the time, I feel like, no, I need to have some drama too. Otherwise, you know, I'm not feeling it. I need to feel it. Um, so it is actually more of, it's more of how you, um, how you react to it. You wrote a lot in your book about how to deal with emotion, how to think about it, which I think it's very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of practical advice that I need to learn from you. And, and, and I'm kind of coming from a different side. Like um, people living normal upbringing, have loving parents and loving spouse and loving friends, may have a, a lot of emotions that they have to deal with. So they need a Google search your, yourself kind of help. I'm kind of on the other side. I'm kind of like, I haven't seen fractions and I have too little. So I buy like books. Every time I see people, like I bought all Rumi's poetry on love. I went to, last night I went to uh, a year of love, a night of Rumi dinner. I find it fascinating because I was trying to learn how to develop my emotion versus managing the emotion. Hi there. First of all, thank you for sharing your stories. A quick question for you is, looking back at your life, um, if you think of a personal decision you made that was under your control, is there something that you can think of that you would change or take back that you personally had a choice and control on if you had a chance today? That's a very good question. So the, what I come to realization is 
What happened to me, I have absolutely no control. But what I do have control is how I feel about it and what is my experience to it. So even bad things happen to you, you could have a different experience and you can feel differently. So those two things I feel I, I do have control. So I, I learn to really appreciate every day that comes to me where I have total, I pretty much have a total control over what kind of day I have. And I, I want to have an interesting day. I'm not saying I just want to have a happy day, right? All emotions are interesting, just like food you want to all taste. I saw a question over there. I've heard people who've uh, survived the adversity to say that there was one moment where they felt that themselves become an adult, whether it was the death of a parent, whether you've lived through so much. Is there one moment where you felt yourself losing childhood and become an adult, or was it just a series of very harsh, nightmarish events? So at eight years old, when I lost both set of parents and became the surrogate mother to my daughter, I was forced to be adult in that instance. I spent my life to try to be child rather than adult. Um, but I think my adulthood is overdeveloped, so I'm trying to work out of the way. So how are you going to be a child again? When I get old, I'll be child regardless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to my friends going to deteriorate, and I'm going to depend on other people. <laughs> I usually say at the two end of your life, you're a child. And, 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 and that's why it's so important for us to show compassion to older people, because they become child again. Mm. First, congratulations on the sale to three systems. I just saw that. Uh, a question for you more loose is about how you plan your career and when you decide to make your changes. How did you decide when you were coming out of Mosaic and starting out with the three systems, uh, with, uh, starting out on three different things against the manufacturing lens, when you were debating how to make these decisions, how do you decide and like teach yourself everything about an entirely different industry and get up to speed on it? And how did you said you learned to learn to learn, but how did you learn to learn? That's a very good question. So I do believe that you, um, not everybody likes to change their life all the time. If you spend all your life to do the same thing, that's perfectly fine. You can perfect something. Like I was having this conversation with Yo Yo Ma not too long ago. He become the best cello player, musician, and everything. Like he envies me changing my life every ten years, but I envy him to be this grand master, right? So it's perfectly fine to be incredibly good at one thing, and I like to change my life every ten or some years because I feel like life is like a mountain range. At every peak, the view is different, um, but. One of the things, if you like that kind of life, one of the things I like to leave with you is you can't always go up. You have to go down to go to another peak. So I did go through job to job to take a pay cut, to take different positions, but what I pursue is a different view. So, so and, and you also don't know if that view is really the view you thought it's gonna be, right? So first thing is you need to know who you are, who yourself, you know. The authentic self. I know I like change. I like variety. I know I view life as a mountain range. So I know who authentic self is. That's one. The second thing that you need to know is what you are passionate about. And you could be passionate about something that you're great at. Then you can be grand master of something. You could also be passionate about something that you're truly interested in, but you're not. You don't know anything about it. Then you go learn about it. So that's kind of what I decide. When do I make change and how and what? It sounds to me like the, the previous team that is you're always doing what you love. And what I you love always do what I love, yes. That's mm -hmm. why I say it's all about love. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ping, for coming. Um, I think your courage to deal with the challenge in life is truly amazing. Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, how's your sister doing these days? I, I hope she's doing well. And the second one is, um, do you travel back to China these days? Do you, do you find it difficult with all those miserable memories, and how do you deal with it? Very good question. So my sister, good thing is my sister is doing very well. Um, I brought her to United States two years after I came to United States. 
she literally went to depression when I left, since I brought her up as her mother. And she is an entrepreneur herself. Uh, she's, she studied architecture, and now she's doing specialty retail in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, she has two very great shops over there. Um, so that's, that's my sister. Um, second question was, I'll travel back to China. Um, I did not go back to China for 10 years until I become U.S. citizen because I didn't feel safe to go back to China, go back to China. I did go back to China after I became U.S. citizen. The very first time I went back to China, I felt lost because China has completely changed and there wasn't the China that I remembered. And, uh, and it was beginning of 90s when China was kind of in the chaos of economic development. I came back and really just felt I'm American now and I wasn't going to go back. But that again changed when China developed and, uh, and I developed. So when I started Geomagic over the time, I actually now have a subsidiary in China. And also when China come to the global scene, uh, when, when China economic, become economic powerhouse, People ask me about China. I have a Chinese face. It doesn't matter what I think. People see me, they ask me about China. I go like, OK, I better go back to study China. So I spent quite a bit of time to study Chinese history, because now the book is also available. More, more objective material is available. I, I, I almost got a PhD in that. Um, so I studied Chinese, Chinese history, Chinese literature, Chinese politics, economics, everything, uh, just so that when people ask me China, I can say something intelligent about it. Now, there's one thing about not going to school, is that you never know when to stop. Because there's no exam, and you don't really know when you know enough. And then, like, I, my stack of book, my, I call them my stack of guilt, just keep growing and shrinking like this. Um, so, so when I do that, I changed my view of China, because I really cannot judging a country with more than 2,000 years of history with my 15 years uh, atrocity or my experience. I just happen to live in the darkest period of modern China. I mean, it's kind of like you can't define Germany with color, Holocaust. You can't define China with cultural revolution. As soon as I tell my wife about your shoes, I know she's going to want them. <laughs> so the question is, where are we today compared to when do we think those type of shoes and such will be available to mainstream consumers at an affordable cost so that people will have them kind of readily available in their houses and such? So it depends on how many Google dollars you have in your pocket, <laughs> and depend on whether or not Google subsidizes shoes like they subsidize books. Um, <laughs> you can buy those shoes today. Um, um, we have a, a, a storefront called Fresh Fiber, which is the brand name for those shoes, and also for like iPhone cases. And you can also find them on um, the site called cubify.com. So the, the 3D systems little printer, personal printer, today is $1,200. Um, it's called a cube, kind of like cubism. And then the website is called cubify.com. The shoes currently is at a price about a few hundred dollars. So it's, you know, it depends on the Google dollars you define whether or not it's affordable or not. It's kind of in the price of Nordstrom. Um, and if you want to customize, it's kind of, uh, it's still less than $1,000. Uh, the shoes in, um, I know shoes in Barney cost more than that. And they don't have on sales, so. <laughs> And also your question is, when does it will reach consumer massive level? My prediction would be within five years. Uh, if no more questions, I have one last question for you. Being if for the past hour, if, uh, if there's only one thing the audience brings back from this past hour, what do you want the one thing to be? One thing for the audience? Yeah, to, to bring home. To bring home. Um, Besides the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Message, right? Yeah. Not shoes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I would say, remember, life is a mountain range. My friends, Ben Not Break available in Google Play and major bookstores, and my friend Ping Fu. Thank you. Thank you. Man. <laughs>